Please don't talk. <laughs> um, I think that's it. So uh, we're going to start with Fran, who's going to join us and talk about the rest between two notes. Don't know if you can see this. Absolutely gorgeous book. It's huge. It's heavy. And a ton of beautiful imagery. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about the actual uh, process she went through with this. So Fran, we'll kick it over to you. OK, let me uh, share. Hold on. I opened up the wrong one. That's OK. Hang on. This is what happens constantly. Okay, so I am talking about my new book, which was published in March by Unicorn Press. It's called The Rest Between Two Notes. And the poem is uh, from a, a poem by Rilke, which says, I am the rest between two notes, which are somehow always in discord because death's note wants to climb over, but in the dark interval, reconciled, they stay there trembling and the sun goes and the song goes on beautiful. So the early concept of the book was that I wanted to have a conversation with my, my viewers. And I felt that art is a conversation with the artist and those people who look at my work as much as it is between the artist's hand and my mind. And I've always been fascinated by how different people look at art and bring their own lives, their own personal feelings into the way they interpret images. So my idea was to include people's responses uh, or inspirations, their feelings into some of my pictures. And in fact, I dedicated to the, uh, to the artist and the uh, dedication is, this book is dedicated to those who take the time to participate in the conversation that is art. So I was approached by the publisher, Unicorn, in October, actually exactly two years ago, 2018. And before that point, I had been thinking about pulling my more recent work into, into book form because my, my images are, are narrative images and it makes sense in many ways to have them in some sort of sequence. Uh, and while I was talking to the pu publisher and thinking about how I put it together, I began to understand that the images I've created over the past decade or so are, um, are, are uh, basically images of solitude, liminal spaces, between states, light and dark, liminal space, spaces. And my images are allegory, uh, portals and passages, architectures. And the way that I started thinking about it was print out about 200 of my, of my uh, images. Basically, I don't have a table big enough, so I, I laid them out on the floor. This is just a little bit of it. I laid it out of the floor and started pulling together images that talked to each other, that had relationship. And the most daunting part of this project and probably any book of art is the organization, the concept and the thematic flow of the work. So throwing these all out on the floor and then mixing them, pulling them together, eliminating images really took many, many weeks. It was very, very daunting until I started to see that certain themes became available. So the first theme was something like symmetry, the, between symmetry and disquiet or between equilibrium and solidity. Another theme was between affinity and absence. And these were just working ideas. These were just titles I was thinking about. So somewhere between arrival and departure. Uh, the, third I, the third idea I had was between history and the present. And the statement I was thinking of is that art's border, art is a border between, the art, 
the border between fact and fiction is a hazy border. The fourth section I was thinking of was uh, the intersection between inner emotions and realities. So between a threshold, crossing the threshold, portals, I have a lot of portals, a lot of windows uh, in, in my work, which forms not only a light source, but a metaphor. And the last section was between exploration and discovery, uh, exterior and discovery. So those were my early concepts. And finally, uh, after many, many weeks, I pulled it together in five different sections, which I'll show you in a minute. The section one is between light and shadow, section two between together and apart, section three between history and presence, section four between missing and meeting, section five is between reality and illusion. So these are very early mock-ups I did. I have a background as a graphic designer, um, so it wasn't hard for me to pull together visual concepts, but I also decided I didn't want to do all of the design uh, on my own. I'm not a book designer. I did design my first book, which is called Escape Artist, The Art of Fran Foreman. But the, the time was very, very tight. I basically had six months to, fi uh, to finish this and I didn't think I could design it on my own. So I did hire a designer, but I gave her the ideas that I had, the concepts of how I wanted to integrate the images and the text and the writings. So these were very early concepts and early ideas for the cover. I tried out many, many different images for covers and eventually um, this was high on the list of possibilities. By the way, this is San Miguel Josephine and eventually came to this cover design. And this is the final book cover. Fran, we're only seeing the original uh, graphic with the cover on it. You see this one? No, this, we've only seen the original, uh, the front cover and the back. Oh, oh dear. Okay. Things aren't moving. Okay, hang on. It, it's from your computer where it's a screenshot yeah. of your uh, uh, okay. PDF. So Okay. So what that is, is the, uh, that's the PDF. So Michael, let me quit out of this for a minute. I'm sorry to take up everybody's time that's because okay. I, have, I have to get out of that. Hang on a second. So this is what you're seeing. So let me get out of that. Okay. So now I'm going to share um Okay, sorry, I'm very okay. sorry. You, okay. you, you need to... Are, it, it should be up now, is it up? Yeah, yeah it is. Okay, so let me just zip through this quickly. Yeah, what I was showing you by accident was the PDF. Okay, these are the images I laid out on the floor, uh, some of the ideas for the concepts, early mock-ups, which I went through cover designs, more cover designs, the final cover, and this one. Okay, so this is the final cover. So we're up to where we were. Um, this is a one page of the uh, table of contents, the press release from, uh, from Unicorn, the book, it's very heavy, it's about five pounds. This is the cover, which you've already seen. I apologize. So uh, this is the, the side of the book. You can see that the edges of, uh, of the pages are red. And one of the reviews 
Chris said, the physicality of the book is also notable. Printed end sheets of a warm tone, golden hued pattern, reminiscent of Victorian wallpaper, which becomes important, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And when the book is closed, the cranberry colored edges of the pages remind me of a slice of red velvet cake. I love that. So I had to put that in there. So the wallpaper is used, wallpaper is used for the end papers of the book, the front and back. And the wallpaper is significant when we get into chapter three. These are just, this is the table of contents. Throughout the book, text accompanies Foreman's images. Some of these conversations are short poetic pieces which complement the work. Some are an interpretation and exploration of specific images. These texts are written by over two dozen artists, writers, poets, curators, photographers, and various people connected with visual arts in some form. So what I did was sent out a letter to people who had commented on my work in the past, asking them if they would be interested in responding to an image in some way for this book. And I sent out, I believe, 34 letters and 33 people uh, agreed and Sandra's one of them. And I was very happy that it was a cross section. It wasn't just photographers, but a whole cross section of various ages, uh, genders, races, and also professions. In fact, there was a, uh, a computer scientist, a couple, some artists, uh, uh, many poets, uh, various other disciplines, lawyers, doctors, but and also a man who had been exonerated, who had been in prison for 32 years. And this is where I explain about how my feeling is that art is a conversation, and I wanted to include their text without editing in the book. So this is uh, the first chapter between light and shadow. And this reviewer felt that my work was an amalgam between Italian Renaissance come Joyce Tennyson come David Lynch. So I love that too. Some of the spreads have a detail. Many of the pages are full bleed. Some are not full bleed. And sequencing is always the hardest thing in putting together a book. So what he says, which refers to this picture, if there was ever a time for me to relinquish judgment based on style and embrace images which are largely based on fantasy, it is now. Case in point, an image of a three-story giraffe standing in a cavernous interior space reminiscent of ruined port porn phonography lit from various mystery sources while a figure plays trombone on the mezzanine level. That feels right. So that was a review uh, that came out in the spring. This is the second chapter between together and apart. This essay was actually written by a physicist. And uh, a poet, a local poet, uh, also a professor of English wrote a poem about images in the book. This is in the center of the book. And this is the third section, which is between history and presence. And this is where the concept, the metaphor of the wallpaper comes in, because I wanted this section, which was bookended by two before and two after, I wanted it to look like a room in a museum that was a portrait gallery. And in doing so, I came up with the idea of using wallpaper to distinguish it as borders to distinguish this section from the other sections. And in fact, the wallpaper was shot at various different museums around the country. 
which was a lot of fun uh, going into museums and actually photographing the wallpaper rather than the pictures necessarily. But wallpaper is used in almost every image in this particular section. And here I'm trying to integrate uh, historical periods with contemporary. The fourth section is called Between uh, Arrival and Departure, Between Coming and Going, between reality and illusion. This last piece was by a novelist uh, named Sarah Farrison. And the reviewer said, I was struck by a short piece written by Sarah Farrison, which accompanies The Last Rhino. Farrison writes a dystopian vignette, which involves the inner strength of a young girl loss of technology, hardship, climate ruin, and quite possibly the last living rhinoceros. And this is the last image and the end paper. Rife with unexpected combinations of ancient and modern elements and with influences as disparate as Edward Hopper, Vermeer and Magritte, Foreman's photo montages are poised between reality and illusion, connection and isolation between light and shadow. And these are various different reviews, which I'll just zip through. How to purchase the book. And this is the special edition, most of which are have been sold out. I think I have two, two special editions left. Also, I just want to put a plug in for this earlier book from 2014, The Scape Artist, which was published by Schiffer. So that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Fran. Sorry, I screwed it up initially. Not a problem. Anybody have any questions? I'm sure. She needs to quit sharing her screen. Ah, right. Thank you. Great. There you go. Anybody have anything for Fran? I, I have a question. Um, Fran, I think having chatted with you during the process of this, I know you had some issues with printing and I wondered if you would feel like talking about them. Maybe not, I don't know. No, I, I don't mind. Um, Sandra's referring to an issue that I had when I received my advanced copies and I was given a fairly strict timeline and I met all the schedules, got everything to the publisher in time and was waiting with anticipation for the arrival of my advanced copy and they arrived in July of 2019. And I opened the box and was completely disheartened when I saw the advanced copies because the printing was not, uh, was not satisfactory. It was as if some of the ink had been laid down incorrectly on some of the pages, not all of them. Some of the pages were fine and the colors were perfect, but I'm very obsessed 
obsessive about color, as you can probably tell. And I was distraught because it just, many of the pages were inadequate and substandard. And there was also an issue with the binding. So I got in touch with the publisher immediately and I said, hold the presses, don't send any of these review copies out. And we went through about six weeks of negotiation in which they uh, basically said, wait until you receive, uh, wait until the uh, books arrive at the distribution center. They might be different than the advanced copies you got, which didn't make any sense to me, but I had no choice except to wait for the distribution center to receive their copies, which were a thousand copies. And when they arrived, it was clear that there wasn't a big difference. So for any of you who are willing to go through the effort to make a book, stick to your guns. So I did, and I, uh, I said, I'm not gonna accept them. And they were not happy about it, but eventually uh, they released me from that part of the contract. And then I ended up hiring a different printer, a different printer's representative. So I took over the printing and the distribution was still handled by Unicorn. But I, in the meantime, during the six weeks of negotiation, I found a different printer, one in uh, Shenzhen called Artron, very good art book uh, printer. And what I came to understand is that there's a difference between a trade book and, an, and a coffee table book, an art book. And I had wanted and had always imagined this would be an art book, not a trade book. And that's what I ended up getting. I mean, you can see that, well, you won't be able to see the difference, but you'll have to trust me. So this was published by, a, this was printed by a different company called Artron in uh, Shenzhen, and they really did a beautiful job, but it delayed the process six months. So I missed the whole Christmas holiday season, which was a shame, but I got the book that I wanted and I, I'm happy with the book as it did come out, but that's what you're referring to. But what happened it, to the uh, original ones? They, <laughs> they actually pulped them all. They were all destroyed and I have a certificate of destruction. So I know that they're not going to be out. I have 20 of those original ones just for my archives, but the rest of them have been destroyed. Uh, I friend, feel a little guilty about that, uh, creating a, a fossil fuel, uh, adding to the climate problem, but. Uh, Fran, um, what, uh, is this offset printing or is it uh, inkjet printing? What, what, what's the printer? How, how are they physically printing them? Well, uh, the files are digital files. Right. So, so um, they were offset printed. But they are offset. Okay. <laughs> yeah, very good. And, and I, I wasn't able to write down the title of your book. It's called The Rest Between Two Notes. Okay, thank you. And that can be purchased? Uh, PhotoEye has some signed copies. Uh, Amazon is the least expensive place to get them because you won't have to pay for shipping. Okay, or yeah, that's, Amazon, that's good. Okay. Or the Strand Bookstore in New York. Uh, my original launch was on March 12th at the Strand Bookstore, which is my favorite bookstore in the world. And that was the day that basically New York closed down. So they still have some copies. Well, the, stun the, the, the photos are stunning. And uh, so I'm, I'm really interested in purchasing the book. Thank you. The design right. of the book is beautiful. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you as well. Yeah, I should have included design also. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you pursued the printing because the color is so, um, so dramatic and unique and really adds to the story and the mystery. So Thank that, you. yeah. A Thank very you. imaginative, creative presentation and imagery. Thank you. It was, it, it was a hard decision. I mean, I always had white hair, but if I didn't, my hair would have turned white during that period of time. Well, my own experience is, is that the printing part of it is the part that gives you a heart attack. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Even uh, in my case, I was able to be on press. Um, even when you're on press, let me tell you, <laughs> it's pretty uh, stressful. So it is a beautiful book. It was worth the effort. Thank you so much. When, uh, when you were negotiating with the printer, they're, they're in China. Um, 
how easy were they to work with and did, what was the process, uh, just a, a synopsis of the process? Yeah. Um, so the, sec the second printer. Right, that's what I meant. Yeah, they, uh, I worked with a man who lives in California who was the printer's representative who, who works very closely with them. And it was a very different experience because I received many, uh, uh, many proofs from them, which I hadn't. I had only received one set of proof from the first printer, which I was naive enough to think that that would be sufficient. This printer was, uh, he was a printer's representative and he uh -huh. was the one that I work with, but he translated precisely what I wanted to his contacts in Shenzhen. What was his name? Because I- His name is Tom Hummel, H-U-M-M-E-L, lovely guy. And his company is called Crash Paper. H-U-M-M-E-L. Mm -hmm. Crash and paper. Crash paper. If you have a hard time reaching him, just let, shoot me an email and I'll send okay. you his contact information. Yeah, because I've been interested in doing this uh, publishing, but uh, it's hard to find somebody good to work. He's wonderful. He really yeah. is. I, I think you. I think you'll be very pleased. For, 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 I had a question about some of the. Sorry, I had a question about some of the um, images themselves. Sure. Um, it's absolutely stunning. But I just was curious about where some of those buildings were very interesting, unique, uh, sort of intricate spaces. I just wonder how you came across those or had access to those types of environments. You know, I don't have a particular image in mind, but, um, you know, across your images, you seem to have a number of very unique, interesting settings for your photos. Well, uh, up until <laughs> this past March, I, I do a fair amount of traveling and that's, and I'm always on the lookout for buildings that I say have good bones or good light, or, but good bones and good light. And some of the images uh, in the book were actually shot in Denmark. Uh, some of the images were in Norway, quite a few in Mexico, some here in New England. Um, some in other places I've gone, I've been known to sneak into hotels and pretend I'm a guest and wander into bedrooms <laughs> or into lobbies to shoot some of those places. So I'm, al I'm always on, on the lookout. Is there anyone in particular you can remember? Um, I did, I, I was curious, there were a couple. There was the one with the giraffe, the oh, inside yeah. of it. <laughs> okay. So yeah. That, and I then the one with that. the rhino. They one I think the rhino was in front of a building. Yeah, yeah. The one with the rhino, the background was shot in Havana, and that's on the Malacan. And the one with the giraffe, this is very odd, but I was in London. I had a show uh, in England a couple of years ago and went into the Victorian Albert Museum. And if you ever go there, go to the second floor because they have, they have uh, a dedicated space to theatrical models and costumes. One of the models is, the, is a model of Shakespeare's uh, Old Vic, the original uh, theater. And I shot the model and that was a model of the original Shakespeare, Shakespeare's uh, 16th century theater. And it was very dark in there. So it was really hard to photograph. So that's what that is. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah, I feel like the book is kind of a travelogue. Where has Fran been recently? <laughs> Fran, I've got a couple of questions in the chat mm -hmm. uh, that I'll throw at you. A uh, couple from Dave. You want to know about the environments, you pretty much just covered that. Um, you seem to have a strong sense of painting with painting with color. Have you painted with oils or other media? Yeah, that's a good question because originally my background was in drawing and painting. And in fact, the work that I do has been referred to as photo painting. And yes, that's very much what I do. So I wield, I wield the stylus as a paintbrush. So yes, I think of these really as paintings and each one is almost, is an individual painting. And that was part of the daunting part of this project was uh, figuring out how they tie together. Because as a painter, painter works generally on one painting at a time, doesn't think in terms of a series. And that's how I work too. So yes, they are, and they are very painterly. And to me, that's the most fun of the entire process. 
Uh, Dave's got another one. Um, he'd like to learn more about the images of contemporary people in historical costume. Could you elaborate a little bit on a few of those? Yeah, those are people, uh, either students of mine or occasionally someone that I meet at random and asked if I can shoot them, bring them into the studio. The costumes are an amalgam of 17th century um, costumes from, from paintings, from old paintings, which I've shot at lots of museums that I've visited. Every image in this book, I'm not sure you're aware of it, and I probably forgot to mention it, everything is a photo montage, everything. Every image is many, many images that have been montaged together. So the Renaissance, uh, the third chapter of the people in Renaissance or 17th century garb, that's all montage. And occasionally I'm able to borrow costumes from the theater department at the university that I work at at Brandeis. So I can uh, occasionally get some, uh, some costumes from them, but most of them are shot from various different museums and then combined together, composited together. Is it correct to assume that you were using a uh, digital, I mean, a uh, phone for the, for the shots? No. Or were you no. using no. So you're I, using DSLR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because usually that a lot of a lot of places will tell you you can't photograph in here, but if you've got a phone, they don't care. So. I know. I know. That's well, crazy. I know. I'm a little sneaky sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or I wait. I I try to do my shooting, and then they'll tell me I'm not allowed to shoot. So. Yeah. yeah. I'm, Better to ask for forgiveness than permission. I, I, I did get into a lot of trouble though with the Broad Institute in Philadelphia and mm. I was basically kicked out. So <laughs> I don't recommend this for everybody. Uh, Pat has one. I don't know if you can condense this down for to a couple minutes. Um, <clears throat> she'd like to know a little more about your creative process. How do you make your images and uh, printing techniques? I know that could probably go on for hours. But. It's a long, it's a, how do I make my images? There's always, some, I have a very large archive of images that I've collect, that I've photographed and collected. And when I don't have any inspiration, I don't feel like doing anything. I just kind of look at my images. I go through them. I remember what I, I try to remember what I have. And if something pops up, something is of interest to me, off in a background, I just might start playing with it. And then I look for uh, something to relate to that image. So I'll continue going through my archives. I don't usually shoot with a specific plan in mind. And if I do, it always changes anyway. So I allow myself the time to constantly uh, uh, see what the relationships are between the background and the people that I've shot or the costumes. So it's a long process. It's fairly organic. It's definitely intuitive. There's no logic to it. So I'm just looking for relationships. And whatever I plan to do at the beginning of the process is always different. The end of the image is always, always different than what I anticipated at the beginning. It's a long process, so. Um. I, I do something similar, and, and I always describe it as starting on a journey that you don't know the destination. Yes, you exactly, know. exactly. That's exactly right. And you have to open yourself up to that. And it's not often successful. I mean, there are plenty, plenty of times. Most times I end up in a dead end. But then you can go back and cannibalize. In fact, during the pandemic, when I haven't been able to get out and shoot as much, I've had to go back through my archives and cannibalize old images that I've found uh, lying around <laughs> various different folders. And I've also photographed using Zoom. That's the other thing that I've done now, uh, trying to keep up. Do you use Photoshop? Is, it, is that the program? Yes, okay. yeah. I live in Photoshop. I've been mm -hmm. using Photoshop since 1992. Oh, wow. Okay. Carolyn has one and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Uh, with Fran. Um, <clears throat> She's asking about your special edition books. Uh, do they come with an original image and pricing compared to the regular edition? Yes, uh, they come with an eight by 10 image and they're 
I believe, three images to choose from. They come in a custom slip case. Uh, and uh, the price now is $400. Because I think, as I said, there are only two or three left. Mm -hmm. And the book retails for $45. Okay. Your, your book is only $45? That's yeah, a pretty, yeah. pretty damn good price. I know it is. I know. <laughs> that was the publisher's idea. They wanted to keep it so that people, they, they assume most artists don't have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> they assume right. Yeah, they sure do. <laughs> Amazon, Amazon.ca says there's only three left. They always say that. Mm -hmm. Don't okay. believe <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they can get more from the distribution center. I can, I can right. assure you. The Canadian price is pretty good. Good, good. Well, thank you all. This was a wonderful opportunity. It was nice talking to you all. I thank do you. want to uh, give Fran a little plug on her new show, which is at the Pucker Gallery in Boston. Um, Self illumination. This is the catalog. And we'll run it, give you a few images to look at. It's an absolutely beautiful show. Um, any of you in that area, hopefully you can get there. It runs from November 21st through January 10th. Um, Many of these images were done during the, this past pandemic. So there's a lot of sense of solitude, as you can see. And a lot of hopper. A lot of hopper. Well, you know, I live near Hopper's house. Yeah. He, so you understand that. That's his house, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great show. If I can somehow get out of here and get to Boston, then that was um, Fran, thank you very much. Thank you. We're going to switch over to Josephine. Are you, in, are you still with us, Josephine? I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep, we've got you. Uh, Josephine's going to talk about a couple things. Uh, first, we're going to go over structures of reverie, which is here. Um, and she too has a show that's uh, open two weeks ago, I believe, in New Orleans. We'll touch base on that. Um, but I'm going to share a screen with everybody on structures of reverie for Josephine. We'll go through it and she'll talk. Uh, Josephine, I wanted to say I have your book, uh, Un Femme Habite. Oh, yeah. Which I, love, which I just love. So. Thank you. That was my first book. Yeah. They did a, the, the Paris uh, people did an amazing reproduction job on my book. I couldn't yeah. believe it. It's just beautiful. Thank you. In fact, the, the, the print, the man who did it, he said that he wanted to use my book to prove that even the most difficult to reproduce photographs he could do. And I was the, I was the, the case in point. Very good. Oops. Here we go. Okay, Josephine, it's all yours. Okay. Thank you for showing up, all you people, whoever is here. Um, I just want to say that that Fran's presentation was, I mean, mind-boggling. The book is beautiful. The, 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 I love the I, all the ideas about how the text that she's used, the subtitles for the sections, all of that. I just, I'm a real fan of, you know, art forms that can be merged together like that. So I thought that was absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm seeing, am I supposed to, what am I supposed to be seeing? My, Images, right? You should yeah. be seeing the trifold, tri three images. Yeah. Okay. Great. And you. And me in the corner. <laughs> okay. Um, the this book, Structures of Reverie, um, 
it has a funny history because normally almost all of my books are, are somehow very closely connected to a literary source uh, that was either uh, I had read and just felt like I knew something about that. I, I could make images about the sentiments expressed or something like that. Or I was working on something that I was very moved by, but I couldn't put it into words and then find a phrase, uh, a sentence uh, that just nailed what I was you know, trying to do uh, visually, which sometimes I don't even know what it is that I'm trying to do. I just have these feelings that are vaguely guiding me in a certain direction, I want to talk about certain things. But in this case, it, there is absolutely no text, which is probably the only book I've ever done that has no connection to um, a literary source of any kind. What, what, it, what it is connected to is a space. And, and it's a whole um, kind of drama of certain spaces that, and their effect on me. And I can tell by the way I feel that something really important to my life and to my feelings is in this space. It's incorporated in this space in some way. And I had to figure it out. So this one, it, it all began in San Miguel. I live part of the year in, in Mexico and I'm so lucky to have that because it's basically my first language. It's my culture and getting connected with that just makes anything to do with art so much easier. So anyway, I was in, in San Miguel and a friend of mine that I had met a photographer who now has a, Joe Brenzo, who has a fabulous gallery in San Miguel. Fran's been, boy, what should have had a show there, I believe she's been, but the pandemic. But uh, a lot of people, a lot of my friends have shown there and people whose photography I really admire. Anyway, one day she says to me, you want to go with me to Jaral de Verio? Um, I take tours out there of people. And I said, well, what's there? And she said, well, it's just this big house, you'll see. And it's kind of in ruin, but it's very beautiful. So I said, sure, whatever. let's go. So me and, I don't know, maybe there were five or six other people. Or we go out there. And when I walked into that space, it was like I was struck by lightning. I had the most visceral uh, response. And I just was walking from room to room and thinking, I've been here before? What does this remind me of? All those kind of feelings of connection. And so of course, uh, I, at the time I shot with a big six by seven uh, Pentax camera. So I'm hauling my camera in very precarious, sort of on very precarious floors and stairways and stuff. But in any case, I just was fascinated. And then I said to Joe, I said, Joe, you think I could come back at some time? Because I'm just so overwhelmed. I, I don't feel like I can take all the pictures I want to take in one day. She said, sure, of course, we'll come back. Don't worry about it. You know, whenever you want, we'll, I'll help you in work. Because it's not open to the public. It's, it's in ruin and it's kind of dangerous. But when we were in there and she was walking the, the, the people through, stories started to come up about that there's a woman that she died here or a young woman and was locked up here but she wasn't and she and it's a ghost now and it comes back and i'm sort of going there you know, i've heard that before i live in the french quarter in new orleans and often i hear as the tours come by i hear the the, the leader of the tour group telling people about my house and about the ghosts that it, and I'm thinking, yeah, 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 okay. But in any case, after I got home and I was thinking about it and just remembering some of these images, I thought there is a feeling of a woman's spirit in that for me. Maybe it's mine, but somehow there, there is a female, a very strong female uh, sensibility present in those for one thing, because they had been, uh, you could see that the, the, the care that was taken with the, the wallpapers and the murals and, the, and they were different, you know, decades over each other, one on top of the other, which just made, for an, for a ready-made masterpiece, I just had, you know, click the uh, shutter. But anyway, 
I started to think about it and I thought, well, if there is, who would it be? If, if there is a female component to this incredible, beautiful place, what is it? And I started thinking about, I had been reading about, um, because women, in, uh, interesting women in history are, are, are incredibly one of the subjects that I really, I really work with. And uh, Queen Isabel, the woman who sent Columbus to discover the new world, et cetera, et cetera, known as the Catholic Queen in Spain, Isabella la Católica, she had a daughter. And I had become really intrigued by this daughter of hers who was very young when, and apparently knew, was given an incredible at home schooling, spoke several languages, was learning about history, was some sort of an exceptional young girl. And so she was married off to, the, to make a connection with Brussels uh, and Belgium. So at the age of 16, she was sent off and married and then led a very unhappy marriage. The husband was started, of course, sleeping around, had mistresses, and she became emotionally and mentally a little unstable, the, the young girl. Eventually, and, and, but she had her Spanish uh, ladies in waiting around her, so she had some connection to her culture that remained, but eventually the man died. She brought his body back, to her, the husband died brought back to Spain and took it through a long, long stretch of Spain because she wanted it buried in a certain place. Okay. Strange, yeah, kind of a poetic sensibility gone a little bit askew, but she was also very much interested in the welfare of the people of Spain. So there's a whole political party that kind of started forming around her, which was not what her mother or her father wanted. So basically they declared her insane. The long story short, they declared her insane to get her out of the public view, locked her with one of her children in a convent prison for 46 years. And she died there, forgotten and wrong. And I just found the story, and she was kept locked in by her first her father, first her husband, her father, her mother. The whole political structure was we can't let the crowds get around her because she'll shift the political to be thrown up the other side. So while she was in there, she begged to be let out. There are things that she wrote discussing her loneliness, her what had she done. To deserve this, da, da, da. sorry, and, and all the people around her, she wasn't allowed to have anyone that she knew uh, as ladies in waiting, and so she died there. And I decided my the concept of this book was that while she was in there, because she was trapped in walls of stone and bars, that she would dream a fantasy architecture that was sort of beautiful and ethereal and that you could walk through the walls, that there was light. In other words, that she came up with a whole structure of architecture where she could live free. And that's what this space became for me, this specific space in Mexico. So um, uh, I'd like to read to you just, just the, my opening little text about what this is. It just says, there's a quote from Marcel Proust, which from the, okay, in comes the 19th century, an incredible, that, that nailed what I wanted this book to say. Thus, my body builds around it room after room. That's a quote from Proust. And he's talking about all the different places where, where he lived and, and that your body creates this, in memory creates these places. This is the story of a woman who invents her freedom by creating an imaginary architecture made of light, scraps of memory, hopes, and dreams, a permeable architecture where nothing is confined. It is dedicated to Juana la Loca, the supposed mad queen of Spain in the 16th century, who for political motives was imprisoned for 46 years by her
father, husband, mother, and son in an architecture, architecture of darkness and stone. So at that point, uh, I sort of had the two things that are usually present in my work, which is what you're ex uh, an experience that's being had and who is having. So I, I always, I very rarely do work that doesn't have a female figure in it or a male figure in it. Uh, in this, like what you're looking at right there, it's the, the image. I work in like, as does Fred and, and Montage, all of my work from 1990, uh, whatever, um, work forward has been, you know, uh, combination of, of various images. And then I also work in my work now and have for the last 10 or 15 years are photo engravings. So uh, those are two things that, you, that tend to be there almost all the time. And, the, and it was funny when, when Fran was talking about that, so much of the, of the work is a, is a matter of trial and error. I would try this with that. No, it's, that doesn't say it. I would try that with them. And then also there was, there's the experience of like putting two things together and something you had no intention of creating suddenly presents itself and it knocks yourself out. So I love dealing with, with the fact that I don't really know how it's gonna work. And then these beautiful things, not always, 90% of the time you say, uh, and, but just keep it on hand. But anyway, so it's through this montage effect. And this, the covers, oh, this, I love this. This was, can you back it up to the one you had before, Michael? With that one. This is, a, I walk into a room in this place and there's this faded mural of these two birds and there's this sort of Arabic motif, this sort of um, arches. And I just thought, my God, you wanna talk about a woman uh, you know, a, a woman's freedom. What could you do better than that? And this was actually a, a, a painting on the bathroom wall of one of the of one of the rooms. So I and I took her as the one looking for for freedom, and then just put put her through that room, and then of course there she went away out. But very often I work in triptychs. It just sometimes it takes me three images to say what I'd like to say. But anyway, um, going when I went back to the space, I just I took every picture I could possibly take of the of the interiors, the exteriors. This one here, and the book is divided into two sections. There's one section called rooms, and then there's one section called flight. So this is kind of like the last section is all about how she got out, the, the, just the, the feeling of flight, the spiritual uh, kind of dimension of flight. This is where she's locked in and she's holding a dead swallow in her hand. And uh, the architecture there, when you could, you could go into one room and, and photograph a staircase, another room would be a different staircase. I would put the two staircases together. It just, I played with that forever, it seems. But it just, it, it was one of these books that just, the space had such an effect on me. And it wasn't until after the book was published and I worked with a book designer, Jacqueline Miro, who was also the model in this, but there were photographs that I had taken of her a while back, but she's Spanish looking and beautiful and I thought like she is, she will embody what the woman in the book. <clears throat> But after I got the book, and I'm looking through it, and I'm happy, happy with it. I lucked out. Uh, I'm like trying to, I really, uh, our printer and our company was just um, incredible. So anyway, I'm looking through it after it's a feta complete. It's a book in, on my coffee table. And I understood something that had, had not even occurred to me at the time, but was clearly one of the driving forces in this in this work, which was, I remember that, that I grew up in my grandparents' home uh, and I didn't move out till I was 12 to my parents' house. And they lived right in the heart of downtown in Laredo, Texas. And 
next door, if you went through their garden and crossed the gate, you went into another garden where there was this huge mansion, beautiful, beautiful, derelict mansion that belonged to my great grandparents and my great great grandparents. And no one lived there. And there was one, I could get in. I knew the lady who had the key and she would let me in and I had a room in there all for myself. And it was empty, but I, it was my club. And I didn't connect that when I walked into this place, I was walking back into that. And I was walking back into the little girl that I was sitting in that room making things up with my friends. And, and, and that, and that, I don't know, it was funny, it was so deep, deeply held in me that it, it didn't, didn't become obvious to me until after I had done all of this and I had found Juana La Loca and made it her story. And maybe someday I'll be thrown on crazy too, but uh, it just seemed so connected in such a beautiful way. And, and the thing about architecture, it's like this, the architecture in this place is, it's various different styles of architecture because this, this was at one point the largest hacienda in all of Mexico. And this guy had so many that he could stay, when he went to Mexico City, he would stay every night in one of his own palaces. And so you can only imagine, and then his, his families, the different generations decorated, added different things. And so it's, it was just, it was, an, it seemed like an imaginary thing to begin with. So anyway, um, in terms of, of putting the book together, I wanted to talk, I wanted the book cover to we talk about architecture. So how do we do that? Um, so what we did is we got some old 19th century blueprints on, online, the pictures of them, and made a composition out of that and then used the architectural drawings, pieces of the architectural drawings as the as a sort of motif on the front. I don't know if you can see the back, but and, and, and any of the motifs that, that are on the, and the, here on the, and this is the fancy book that, that we only make five hand made books with original prints. But the trade version, um, it's uh, at the printing was, I was very happy. I felt like it, it was as good as, as you get. And I would love it. So anyway, um, I, since then, I've gone on to do other things, but uh, basically I would like to have a beautiful original handmade book and a trade book of everything I've done. And that's what I'm gonna do before, 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 you know, before. Um, so I'm working right now, I have a new show at the gallery here that hopefully will eventually be a book. And there's a couple of other things and the books that I did for Stephen Albahari, I don't know if anybody else knows about 21st um, Publishing, are oh, they beautiful. But those books that I made for him, and he's the one that inspired me because he took my work and, and those are all original. Some are silver prints, some are gravures, uh, and showed me what a really perfect rendition of these stories that I tell. Because basically, like Fran, I have a narrative, a strong narrative. And it's very rare for me to do pictures that are not all connected. So books, the obvious, and I want to live on people, in people's living rooms and bookcases, and, and do do for them what when I sit down and I pick up a, I'm on my couch and I pick up a book by Joseph Sudek, I'm so grateful to have that, to, especially right now, to have that kind of thing to, to inspire me to sink into to you know, have a little tete a tete with beauty. And so I, I just think the book is so wonderful. And I really want to, I just want to keep doing it. And I don't want to use up all the time, my things for this. But. Josephine, can you take a minute and talk to us about Luna Press? And Luna Press, my husband and I started it, partly because we wanted to do books ourselves and do them at inspired somewhat by what Steve uh, Abahari had done with his, only a, a less expensive. And so we've done, and, and the, the basic theme of the, the connects with all these books 
is that most of them have to do with images and text, which is something that was really my husband's writing. So, uh, but Opus and he did these French water pages. And we, we did some cards. We, we just do whatever. And then I do some books for um, the photo Nola. Uh, we did that invention reality. And we, we've done, these are all the books that we've done at Lola Press. And, uh, it, you know, we have to pay for them. We have to do them. But and we probably lose money. I, I, I try not to look at the figures. But we do because this is what both of us really want to be out there. This is what we really want to do. That one's about a, a famous man in Mexico that eats potato. This one is about an incredible, that one has a lot of text. Both of those have the text that inspire them in the books. As I say, uh, almost everything I've done has a text except for this one. And the, the one I'm doing, the, the show that I did now, has a, a, a has some text as well. But yeah, so that gives you an idea of the kind of things that we do. So, and if anybody has, can, nobody's going to be able to travel to see the show in the gallery, but it's it's up. We just did it. I was halfway through when, when the whole thing, uh, you know, with the pandemic happened. So we, we decided we really, We'll have to do some sort of Zoom opening, which we did two weeks ago. But I got put it up on the walls, and it's there, and it looks beautiful. And I feel like I had a show. <laughs> I don't know how many people, although we, we have sold quite a few. I've, and I think it's mostly from people seeing you know, on the Zoom. And but anyway, it's a kind of a strange space right now. Josephine, we're going to open it up to questions. Um, what was the name of the gallery in San Miguel? It's uh, Photographic, Photographica, Galeria okay. Photographica. And it's, a, it's an excellent gallery. If you, people should zoom in, do their, they're doing a bunch of film stuff. You know, they're trying to hang on. But they, uh, I, I got photo in order to invite Joe. Uh, to come to look at stuff. And she has gotten put together so many exhibitions from stuff that she saw here in New Orleans, mm -hmm. which has been great. And Fran and, and Wendy Schneider and myself, uh, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people that are really good. And it's a great gallery. Good. And my gallery in New Orleans. Okay, who's got questions? Okay. I'm ready. Somebody's got to have a question. I've got a question. Okay. This is, my name is Pat, and uh, I'm very interested. I, I meant to see if I could write this up in the chat, uh, but it's too, too complicated to put in a sentence or two, so I'll try to muddle through a question here. I'm very interested in the creative process, and listening to the both of you, you and Fran, I, it, it seems you have some very strong commonalities in the way you approach uh, your, your own creative process, but then some differences too. For example, with Fran, uh, it seemed that, uh, well, there's a connection between making the individual image and then putting multiple images into a cohesive narrative. And forgive me, Fran, if I'm putting words into your mouth, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded to me like you go through the laborious process of making your images um, and then uh, with your process of putting all your photos on the floor, you sought to find connections, uh, a narrative. Whereas uh, Josephine, it sounds like perhaps you have an overall narrative in mind and even though the individual, uh, the process of making individual photos is just as laborious as Fran's, you are kind of moving at it from a storytelling perspective from the outset. So I don't know if I'm correct in that, but I'd be very interested in, in hearing more about, uh, you know, uh, just starting out with a, a story in mind and making it or creating a story out of uh, 
you know, whole cloth as it were uh, in Fran's case. So anyway, hope that makes sense. Well, um, definitely. Uh, I have usually something, has, I'm, I'm something, I'm involved with some, either I'm reading some poetry, like I was a big, uh, my first book that I ever did, the first thing I ever did was about real, you know, elegies, and that was done by 21st as well. But usually I have something that's moving me, whether it's a, a landscape or a, or a story or a poem, and, and I sort of start working, but I'm not sure where it's going to go. But usually I, I end up having definitely once I find what I figure out what I'm doing, then I do a whole series around that feeling, that idea, that person, that, what, that space, whatever it is. But yeah, I, I, I very rarely do random photographs, you know. I, it just, there's always a narrative element, but I also try to keep the narrative element kind of like open-ended so people can project their own narrative in, into it. But that's, it's true. I do, I do start with a story, start with an idea, not, I start with some pictures and then somewhere I find a text that, that puts in words what I'm trying to do and then I'm off and that's where, and I know I'm off in a way. I don't know, Fran, you, you yeah. have a different uh, it, It's similar, but um, you're somewhat, you, it sounds like you start with the written word and then you take the written word and, and use your imagination to visualize it in a way. And that's what starts your process. Is that right, Josephine? Uh, kind of, but you, usually not, not quite the written word so much as, it really actually starts with, take a picture in some kind of way, and then the, and, or maybe I'll do two or three, and then the written word informs me. I see. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm, my process is very similar. So yeah. I start with images and yeah. um, finding images that work together, that resonate for something, depending on my emotional state at the time. For yeah. example, the past eight months, my emotional state has been pretty depressed. So yes. a lot of my images are reflecting that and what we're all going through. But for me, the use of the written word comes much, much later in the process mm -hmm. than it does for you. So I'm, I'm more involved in finding images that work together to produce the narrative, but it's a visual narrative. It's mm -hmm. not a literary narrative. Yeah, I think mine, mine becomes a, a visual narrative too, but it's something like, for instance, the, the the, the one on the show that I have up now, uh, it's based on the life of a woman who lived in the 1920s in Mexico, a muse, artist, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I knew I, I was, wanted to do something about her, but what about her did I want to say? What about her? And then one day, out of the blue, a quote, I came across a quote, those who dance are called insane by those who cannot hear the music by Nietzsche. And I said, of course, that's what I'm going to do. Of course, I'm going to show this beautiful, wonderful, incredibly complicated and interesting person being one, and it's called those who dance. For sure. So that in that way, the, 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 the words, could, you know, they just sort of nail for me all the wandering around spirits of in, while I'm in the process of doing something. But it, that when once I got th that phrase, then I knew exactly what the work was about. And that's what I was going to try to do in the most eloquent way I could. So in that sense, that's what so, I, uh, Josephine, I was very interested um, in the images in which you used Harald de Barrio as your backdrop and as a starting off point. So uh, I also photographed quite a bit in there as well. Mm -hmm. But you were able to somehow integrate your narrative uh, with those images, especially the mural, that incredible mural, which I've also photographed a lot, but I could not figure out how to use it. Oh, and so funny. I was very impressed that you actually were able to incorporate it into your imagery in a way oh, that I just thought was very beautiful. That's really interesting because I'm sure you would do something wonderful with 
Halal de Radio, but completely different from what I do. I, it is very different. It is. <laughs> but, but yours was just wonderful. And especially that particular mural, the way that you oh, used thank it. You, thank you so much. That's, it was so great to use. I, I have a question. It was a, yeah. it was a real knockout. And I love the fact that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, can, I just, uh, can I just pop in and say thank you both very much, Fran and Josephine, for that lovely uh, chat you had based on the question I asked. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. It was a, you, you posed some interesting questions. Josephine, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, um, I noticed that recently you've been posting some images on social media that I hadn't seen before. Are those in, um, images from one of a new book, or are those from your show, or are those even newer than that? They, they are the the one of the blue one of the that is something I'm working on right now. At, as we speak, I've only made two images, that one and one that I haven't made it yet. It's it's being printed out as a positive to take to be engraved, but uh, that that's what that is, and that is because I had this this the the human figure, the girl, is a friend, the daughter of a friend of mine, and I took her picture 25 years ago. And I remembered that picture, that profile picture of Philippe, and I thought, well, I don't look at that again. And I started playing with that. And again, this, this is exactly an example of how it works for me. So I found those pictures of Hildy, and I thought, oh, well, maybe those with this and that, and, that. and then I found a word which I had never heard before, which probably you all, all know, which is photism. A photism is a hallucinatory sensation or vision of light. And I thought, that's it. I'm going to do a small series of photisms. Because I couldn't tell what it was about these images that I was making. What is the, what is the subject? What am I dealing with here? And it's that. So it's like that with language in me. But yes, that's new. And the other one is one that I had forgotten I made and found and liked. And so the one of the virgin all sort of cute, right. uh, I had never printed it. Well, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So nice. Ah. Anybody else or should yeah, we? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask one of my, yes, my okay. Um, Josephine, I was curious about a little bit about your background in your earlier days as a photographer. You were a much more sort of literal photographer, um, maybe looking outside yourself much more than you do at this point. What was it that uh, let you evolve into a much more personal sort of introspective photographer? Can you talk to that? Yeah. I can because it was a very complete uh, change. Uh, I was a street photographer and I was, I came here from France in 1973 with my husband and we worked as journalists. I worked as a journalist on the living and he did too. And then, but for my personal interest, I was doing street photography and I did, in fact, I'm, that's gonna, we're gonna do a book about that too. Um, I was photographing this. Thing. I was amazed with the, the French Quarter, the kinds of people that you would see the different. This was in the 70s. It is not the case now. And uh, the mixture of people that I felt like, God, these people would never see each other or know each other if it weren't for this place, this magical place where all, so much takes place afterwards. And I continued working on that for a couple of years. And I had an exhibition of that. With, couple of exhibitions of that work. It's called Sanctuary. But after a while, and this is something that I've spoken about before, um, I started to see, and when I first came here, I was totally enchanted. Then I started to look after a year or two or whatever, I started seeing things that were uh, unpleasant or sad or tragic. And I started to see sort of the backstory for some of these very folkloric looking black tap dancing kids, you know, and, and the, the photogenic charm of all of that kind of stuff. Then I started seeing the, the drug dealer. And then I'd see 
uh, women that were just like derelict and, and miserable. And I don't know. And I just started to get really depressed. And I wanted to see beauty. I felt like I needed to see. Some, I didn't want to. I didn't want to become the photographer that photographs people's misery and then has gallery shows. I just felt wrong. I felt like I'm not doing them any good. I, and so why am I doing this? I'm going to go try and find something beautiful. And then I realized, well, you know, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to make it because I just don't see it. I mean, I could have gone to City Park and photographed the tree because that's always an option, but because they're beautiful. But I just decided you want, you need beauty make it. So a, a friend had offered me this space uh, to share with her for a hundred bucks a month in the French Quarter, a studio that was gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. So I asked a friend to come in there and let me take her picture, but I didn't know what to do with it. I had never done that in my life. I had never asked someone to pose. So uh, I did, and then, that's, and then at that period, which was in, nine, by then it was about 1980, maybe, yeah. Um, I started reading Rilke's Reno Elegy and the, the descriptions of the angels in, in, the, in the elegies. I thought, well, God, maybe I could get some people with no clothes on to do it, to sit around and yeah, like that. And it was just step by step like that. And then I realized this, this is what, this is what I have. Done. This is, if I want to make some, see beauty, I'm going to make it. And no one is going to be, I'm not going to be sacrificing or using people's misery in a, in, a, in a way I couldn't deal with, which is not to condemn people who do it, like Salgado, who I think is a genius, and he does wonders for the people that he photographs. I didn't feel like that was what I could do. And so that, that's where the switch came. And okay. in 1990, one of the first extended things that I did was with my friend Jacqueline, who I worked with for 30 years, just because I, I I was uncomfortable asking people to pose for me. She was, I asked her, she said, sure. We became best friends and I worked with her for years. But it's because I felt the impulse that I needed to create some kind of something beautiful. Wow. Thank you, thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Is that gonna do it today? No more? If not, I want to thank Fran and Josephine very much for joining us today, along with all of you that stuck around. Um, next month on November 21st, <clears throat> we're going to bump it to 2.30 because we've got a Zoom workshop that morning that ends at 2. So at 2.30, uh, we'll have Jenny Sampson talking about Skater Girls. It's an absolutely gorgeous project she's been doing. And Robert Schultz we'll be discussing the book he did with Bin Ma, Bin Dan, I'm sorry, uh, memoranda, war memoranda, photography, Walt Whitman and memorials. Two very different subjects, but two great books. And again, thank you all for coming and we'll see you next month, I hope. Thank, thank you. you Thanks so much. Thank, thank all of you guys that came, thank you. It was wonderful. Great to meet, visit with you. Thanks, everyone, take care. Okay, bye. Bye. Okay, looks like we lost both. Everybody left me. Okay. <laughs>